<coughs> and now we're ready to go. This is Hebrews part one, lesson number five. And look here, see they're all here, they're ready to go. And all these people have studied very hard this week. Right, ladies? We'll see if they're there or not. Yes, 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 yes. They said they have. And see, most of the time they chat with me back and forth. They can talk to me if they want to. But that's what they do most. Can I say something? Huh? Can I say something? Very quickly. So anyway, let me pray for us, ladies, and then we'll jump off into uh, uh, the lesson. Are there things that we need to lift up? Rachel, we continue to pray for your son, David. That hello was from camp, by the way. <laughs> He's learning how to type. Well, you got to learn how to do it properly. Oh, okay. Oh, it can't be quite. <laughs> you see what Carol said there. I uh, appreciate prayer. Not sure what is going on. Just a feeling of chaos when there isn't really. Okay, y'all hang on a second. Okay, I'll be right back. Meemaw's here, so I'm going to take camp outside. Yay. Thank you. all I'll be right back. Okay, thank y'all so much. Let me see what you said here. Carol said. Lynn's response. Yeah, what Carol said there about uh, uneasiness. Hmm. Ooh, I think we've all been there. We're struggling with something. It's hard to know what to do. You want to press on and press on and press on as far as you can, even if you're not able to do it as well as you wanted to. Okay, let me pray for us, and we'll continue to talk about some of this, I think, right here. So, Father, I thank you. You know the situations in each one of our lives. And Lord, the first thing we want to do about every one of these situations and what's happening and where we are right now is to give you thanks. Uh, forgive us, Lord, for how we forget to do that. And uh, But you've told us that in everything to give thanks. And so, Father, we give you thanks. Uh, <laughs> Lord, yes, not necessarily for everything, <clears throat> but in everything, we give you thanks. Uh, Father, you know what's going on there with David, and you know the plans that you have for him. You know, you've known Lord since the foundations, before the foundations of the earth, what he's going through right now, what he's thinking at this very moment. And um, it is good to be reminded of that and to know that, Lord. So we rest in you and we trust in you. Uh, Lord, may he continue to seek you. May he continue to realize what you have for him, whatever that may be at this moment and at this time. 
and then uh, walk in that and step forward in that and rejoice in it. Uh, Lord, for what Carol's talking about, Lord, I think we're all in that type of thing, realizing uh, that some things are happening. They're stirring afoot. And, um, and that's okay, God. I'm excited about that, though. I know it may be uncomfortable in many, many ways, <clears throat> but I know who we are and I know whose we are. And so, Father, we rejoice in that. I thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given us this week just to chase around a topical idea here and the insight that we've received and even more, Lord, that you're going to give us now and uh, in the future. So, Father, just teach us and show us your truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, following up a little bit with what Carol's talking about right here, <clears throat> she says she feels like that there's just sort of chaos when there's not really. And then she backs off and says, well, not so much chaos, maybe uneasiness. Been praying about it, some insight. And, you know, I, I assume that you're talking about maybe, you know, at a personal level, a family level, what's been happening in transition in y'all's life and stuff like that. But I think that's something that's probably uh, appropriate for everything that we're looking at. Uh, what does Ephesians 6 tell us about such things? It tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? Yeah, Rachel says she felt sort of visionless. Yeah, I think we all sort of go through seasons where you just keep pressing on and doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you'll think, why am I doing this? You know, what's going on? Am I supposed to be doing this, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, but our battles against principalities and things within the heavenly realm. And this week you did a whole little topical study on angels. Okay, uh, just looking, you know, particularly at them. And this sort of ties in right here together with some stuff, I think, even far deeper than uh, uh, what our lesson went into. You know, and I, I understand that. Um, so Rachel says, I feel at the beginning of the year an attack of discouragement just about every day. Yeah, the enemy uh, seeks to come against us. Somebody call me from California, man. I'm really popular today. I don't know what the deal is with that. I don't know how it is down in New Zealand, but here in the States, these robo computers just hit regions and just, just slam your cell phone for a period of days. So Carol's not seeing Rachel's comments. That is just so weird. Uh, we've had a little strangeness that has occurred with that in recent times. And again, as I said last week, I'm still um, uh, looking for options for uh, our times together right here. I found a great one, but it doesn't do one thing that we really need. And so they say they're going to do this one thing in an update, but I can't get a date out of them when they're going to do it. And so uh, <clears throat> Jan sees Rachel's comments. Um, you know, I don't know what the deal is. I don't even know what to suggest. I mean, I'm, you know, click on her face down there. Maybe it'll do something with that. I don't know why that gets crossed my mind, you know. I really don't know what the deal is with that. It's a conspiracy. There you go. So uh, I, I really think that the uneasiness and that kind of thing that's happening. Uh, remember this, folks. Uh, uh, the enemy is the one that condemns us. Okay. I've said this several times. The enemy condemns us. God convicts us. Okay. God will not bring discouragement against us. Okay. The enemy seeks to condemn us, and in condemnation, there's no hope. The Lord will convict us, and that convic that conviction brings hope. And so when you're feeling discouraged, when you're feeling sort of down, and we all do that. I mean, I dare say that most of us go through cycles of that on a daily basis in some form or another, okay? Because the enemy is seeking to distract us and to come against us. And so uh, realize that, okay, you take captive those those fiery darts that the enemy seen, sends. That's exactly it. When, when you have an idea or you've had sort of a victory in something or God has really done something, uh, just one of those moment things that he's done in our lives. I had it, I had it this morning. I had a really interesting thing happen that was totally unexpected. And um, at about seven this morning with a group of men, okay? And uh, it was great. And two or three other things happened right at, later in the morning that were just really, God's just doing great things. And I knew what would happen by early afternoon. <laughs> What's going to happen? You're going to be distracted. You Something's going to occur, you know, that kind of thing. You just keep pressing on. Yeah. So uh, just a real, real quick review. We're studying Hebrews. Uh, what is Hebrews about? Just real quick. I don't want to lose sight of the big picture of things. 
It's about Jesus. Thank you. And that Jesus is what? He's better. Yeah, he's better. And better than, and if you want to put that, better than what? Better than anything. Better than everything. Yeah, he delineates certain things. And there's certain things um, that they needed to hear. And it is everything, no doubt. What were some of the things that they needed, needed to hear that he wrote in this letter, whoever the author was, that he wrote in this letter to them? What have we seen so far? Jesus is better than... Yeah, the big thing that we're looking at this week's angels. That's the reason we're doing it, because in the first two chapters, uh, he deals a lot with that. He actually starts off at the very beginning that he's uh, better than the prophets. He's better than the law. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the tabernacle. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better than Moses and Aaron. He's better than Melchizedek. Okay? He's actually better than all these great folks that have uh, lived their life by faith. Okay, He's better than the old covenant. So Jesus is better, and the thing that comes along with that in relationship with us is that um, what are we to do? Jesus is better, so in light of that, what is our response? Give me a one-word response. Believe. There you go, Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> we're to, yeah, okay, jam. Yeah, we're to listen and believe. And that's what he starts off with them in the second chapter. He says, you know, hey, you need to pay attention to what's being said here. And you need to pay attention and don't drift away. Okay. Don't um, neglect what we've received right here. And so that's the big picture of what he's talking about uh, that Jesus is our high priest. Now, why do you think that all, he launches in the first uh, chapter about angels? I mean, he says a good bit about him. And why comparing Jesus uh, to angels in such a way from the get-go? Okay, he's telling them who Jesus is. But why angels? I mean, in our society, that nearly sounds like comparing Jesus to unicorns, you know? Okay, yeah, because angels had been used by God to communicate them to them in the past. They were very important in the Old Testament. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think he wanted to get into some things there, Rachel, yeah, about Jesus and who he is, and that he's not just an angel, but the Son of God. Remember what we talked about last week, dealing with his uh, divinity. And so he wanted them to understand some things. Yeah, they, uh, what was the Jewish mindset? Let me ask it this way. What was the mindset of the Jew, and particularly even the redeemed, saved Jew, in relationship to angels? <laughs> oh, and Rachel's got a great question. <laughs> Why did God create angels or and sons of God? Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we will delve into that. Okay. Well, the, the reason is this, not the Rachel's question, but the question I just asked was, uh, that's it, Lynn. That's exactly what you see. Historically speaking, in the way they were, uh, were the angels, <laughs> that's sort of funny. It sounds like a, a, a pop or country song, angels put on a pedestal. Uh, they nearly worshipped angels. Okay. And some did. And some in our society today do. I mean, you can see it in the... Uh, uh, just the uh, the various um, creative arts kind of things, the music and books, TV, movies, angels, that kind of stuff. Perversions of things, yes, Barbara, because remember that one verse y'all looked up? Really, a couple of them you have to examine, the how angel can uh, uh, Satan can appear as an angel of light, and that his minions also can be servants of righteousness. Nobody ever looks at that next verse. I think we got a lot of servants of righteousness that are actually servants of the enemy. So Rachel says, so angels can't enter into salvation, only humans, but angels can operate in the unseen world. So let's go back to Rachel's questions right here. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Angels cannot enter into salvation. They cannot receive salvation, only humans. And I think that's the reason that the verse, uh, 
I don't think we looked it up this week because this wasn't a, 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 you know, a totally blown out study on angels. Um, the verse that says that angels look into the gospel, they're really intrigued. They longingly look into the gospel. They know what God has done. Okay. They know why he's done it. And I'm talking about, for lack of a better term, the good angels. Okay. They know why, but no, they can't experience it. Now, the good angels don't need to experience it. The Again, for lack of a better term, the bad angels uh, cannot receive it. But back to uh, Rachel's original, original question there. Why did God create angels and or the, and are the sons of God? Uh, why did he create them? What do y'all say? Uh, yeah. Well, there's, well, did he do it to minister to us, Jan? Uh, uh, Rachel says he wanted worship. Uh, Lynn says a ministry agent, uh, agents for God to be messengers. Yeah. Well, just about any time uh, that somebody asks me a question about why God did anything, I really start with a foundational thing uh, because he wanted to. And I'm not being smart mouth and flippant about it. But it's simply the desire of his heart. He wanted to. Why did he create all of creation? Okay. And you see uh, major hints of it all through scripture. Uh, you know, the sun, moon, and stars, and everything like that. The creation testifies of the Lord. Okay. He created man to be in communion with him. And so Rachel says, oh, so I guess I have to ask, what is the purpose of angels? So, you know, when you did your little, uh, uh, Word studies, when you looked at the very scripture passages this week, what did you find out about actually what the word meant in Hebrew and in Greek? And what did you find out the purpose of angels were? Uh, you've already said a couple of them, ministering spirits, ministering angels. Uh, yeah, both the words meant messengers. Okay, messengers. And, and basically an angel is just God's messenger. Okay, And, you know, <laughs> some commentators get sort of a, not irreverently flippant about it, but you'll say, hey, you know, they're just basically messenger boys, uh, which is, you know, sort of true. You notice that they're always men, too. Oh, so before humans, who are they messaging? Well, why do you think they were before humans? Yeah, they, they, they watched certain things of creation. You saw that in Job, right? You they, they watched and saw certain things. Is it they were just created to communicate with humans? Somebody uh, mentioned, well, Rachel, it was you, I see it up here, uh, that they are very involved in worship, in worshiping the Lord God. Uh, when were angels created? I like that, Lynn, to execute God's purpose. You see that? And and what, uh, how did that work out? And purpose in what ways? What did y'all see this week when you were looking and doing all the cross references? They had position of authority, positions of authority related to what? No, I don't think we have been told when they were created. Okay. A lot of times we assume that they were created long before we were, but that's not true because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. He created everything. And you see that he cre uh, created, was it Colossians, I think, that had the scripture passage that angels are created living beings of God. So we know they're created. Uh, we don't know exactly day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six type of thing. But I think they were created within that time period. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong because the scripture doesn't tell us point blank when they were. Yeah, we sort of made the assumption that it was before he created the heavens and the earth, but wait a minute. Why am I limited to what heavens are? Why am I thinking just maybe of the atmosphere or just thinking of uh, space? But there's a problem with that because, you know, the sun, moon, and stars are not created till later on. Actually, after he creates light, <laughs> you know, which is intriguing in itself when you look at the sequencing of things there. And so we don't know. We don't know, but we know that they, that they function as messengers. Okay, we know they function as worshipers. 
we know that they execute the uh, uh, purposes of God. I, I love the way you are saying this, and that they have uh, positions of authority related to that. What were some of the things that the Lord called them to do? Now, there was one verse, what was it, over in Job 38? And I love the way some of the people say, uh, it seems like that he created them before the earth's foundation. Well, why did it seem like that way? Well, it's because they're rejoicing in heaven when they see what God has done, you know? And he very well may have. We simply don't know, okay? They exhort people to obey. Very good. Yeah, so they come along with the word and the message, uh, uh, obey, and don't be afraid. So they come with informational things. That's the messenger part. What else do they do? Do God's bidding related to what? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, is it just showing up? And, oh, you got that morning star thing right there. Yeah, the princess, and they sang together. Well, and Jan says anything he wants. We actually saw in some of the cross-references this week, folks, where they were executing God's judgment, right? Yeah, that they would bring forth uh, a word of what the Lord wanted to do, of leadership. Uh, you see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. Yeah, you see them coming along, bringing judgment. Yeah, you got that uh, Revelation 12 thing about war in heaven. So there's this fighting thing. We know that they're powerful. We know that they are um, uh, invisible for the most part, but they can be visible. How do I know they can be visible? Yeah, okay, Hebrews tells us about that. Uh, Rachel says they don't marry. How do you know they don't marry? They can't appear to people. What did Luke 26 say? I don't remember exactly. I guess I could look it up. 2036. Okay. What does that say? Can you quote it right there in front of us? Well, now you're jumping over the mark. You're oopsing me everywhere here. <laughs> mark 12. 25. Let me see, because each one of the Gospels has little nuances on this. <coughs> For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Uh, <laughs> this is page 32 of the lesson. Uh, this, as a matter of fact, let me tell you this. I shared this with uh, uh, the men this morning. That was part of the thing I was talking about earlier. And the guy that was supposed to come and bring a little thought for the day was sick. And so I'm like the emergency standby guy. And the, the leader of this group came up and says, hey, I don't think he's going to be here. Can you share some? I went, sure. And I was sort of torn between sharing this and sharing Ephesians 4. And by the time I got there, I did both together. Because I think it's so important for us to understand what's going on here. This is where, um, whether it's this passage or over in Matthew 22, you see the same thing. Uh, the Pharisees are trying to set Jesus up. Okay. And it fails. It was a thing to given the Caesar, the thing of Caesar's. Well, the Sadducees sort of chuckled about that. The Pharisees are the modern day uh, conservatives. The Sadducees are the modern day liberals. And Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. One of the gospels say that, I think it's Matthew. And they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the afterlife. So really, like, what's the point of belief then, huh? And so they come to Jesus with a question about resurrection. It was one about the woman who uh, was married. Her, she and her husband didn't have a son. And so um, uh, when he died, she married a brother to have a son. Well, all seven brothers died, et cetera, et cetera. Y'all know the story. And Jesus looks at him and says, you know what? You do err. You do not understand the scripture nor the power of God. And that was my point for us today here was that we err not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. Well, here the next verse in Mark 12 says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Those that are resurrected from the dead but are like angels in heaven. And so we sort of assume that because of that, that the angels don't marry. But it doesn't say point blank that the angels don't marry. Okay? It doesn't say. 
they neither married nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. I think it's a safe assumption. Okay. I think that is what's being taught there. But sometimes people go they're distracted by it. What I'm really interested in is well, what does that mean? Uh, you know, because the angels that we see are men, are there female angels? <clears throat> you know? And so we, we simply don't know. You know. The ones we see in scripture are like that. Now, let me ask you this before I, I don't want to lose this thought. Yeah, is well, is it that we're genderless? And then there's also something else that goes with this thought. Um, in the, the, the precept homework, I don't remember if they did it in the homework or if it was in some other commentaries. I, I read it at a bunch of commentaries. Um, are angels, and Lynn, you asked this earlier, uh, not Lynn, uh, Rachel, the way you said it, you actually said and or. Are angels and sons of God synonymous? So Rachel says, why did God create angels and or sons of God? Are angels and sons of God the same? Yes, yeah, so Rachel's mentioned in Genesis 6 right there where the angels uh, co-inhab- uh, cohabitated with the daughters of man. And uh, are they all male? So are angels and sons of God synonymous? So Rachel wasn't sure, so you put and or. Anybody else? So what about this angels and sons of God and stars? Is there every time you see the word stars, is it referring to an angel? (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean like a science fiction movie? <laughs> oh, so Lynn's taking the sons of God from the point of view of the resurrection. And you do see that. So here's the big thing. Uh, the context is what's going to drive the interpretation. <coughs> because you have to see what the context is. But no, angels and sons of God are not the same. They're not the same thing. And as a matter of fact, the sons of God are an entirely different level of of uh, unseen creature. Can I say that? Being. Thank you. Maybe that's a better word. Yeah, of being. Remember uh, that stuff we talked about maybe last fall? I don't remember when it was. Uh, about the divine council thing. We talked a bit about it last week. And uh, yeah, I know page 30 says there are. And y'all have learned a long time ago that homework can be wrong, right? Once you realize that punctuation and capitalization is a form of commentary. And when you read whatever version of translation you got of your scripture, that, that there's commentaries going on. Now, I'll tell you what, that angel book, I'm reading that angel book right now. And uh, it gets rather, uh, it's more academic than I thought it was going to be. Okay. i tell you what would be really helpful. I can't remember. I don't think I put it up there. Maybe I did. Did I put his podcast up on the Facebook page? I think I did put his two podcasts up. Um, uh, that are related to angels. Uh, yeah, I, I think I did like maybe a few days ago. Those are very helpful. Um, but anyway, I think we have to keep in mind, uh, uh, which one was it? The Unseen Realm? Uh, he's got another called Super. Yeah, Supernatural is like the uh, Unseen Realm Simplified. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't think it was that academic. When I got the Unseen Realm, it just blew me away. And um uh, and I'm not that super academically oriented of mind, you know. Um, so the whole thing with this is uh, page 30 refers to Old Testament. I don't know, Lynn. Tell me what it is. I don't even have those pages in front of me. They're at home. <laughs> I'm down in the cave. But anyway, Psalm 82 uh, talks about, several other Psalms talks about a divine council. And when you see the word that's used there, it's the word Elohim. And so here's the bottom line that freaks people out, but trust me, it's true. There are other Elohim, okay? Elohim is a a name of a type of divine being. Yes, God is Elohim, 
there are other Elohim. The other Elohims are not God. God is the most high of all gods. That's the reason when he says that he's the God of all gods, it actually makes sense. I'll say, oh, the homework says angels are also referred to in the sons of God in the Old Testament. There we go. Uh, yeah, that's not correct. Okay. Now, there may be a time where angels are called sons of God, but generally speaking, when he's talking about the sons of God, it's speaking of the Elohim. And I think that also gives us some insight to the, some of the stuff that's said in Job, Job 38 and stuff like that. So just keep that in mind. I don't want to get into all of it. If it's something that interests you, uh, the Heiser stuff is absolutely amazing and very, very, very helpful. The only reason that I would really suggest maybe is wading through. Uh, and when you get to that, some of the academic stuff is really up front in that book. You can just sort of, you know, glance through it sort of quick, not get bogged down in it. It's because I know that he's already sent off the next book. And the next book is going to be on demons. Okay. So it's sort of a, um, a link right here. Oh, it's uh, uh, his last name is Heiser. Uh, his website is Dr. Michael S. Heiser. I think that's it right there. It's his website. And you can find the links to the books and that kind of stuff. This guy's very well respected. Does a lot of stuff with Logos. Uh, all of his stuff is well worth your time. His podcast called the uh, Naked Bible uh, podcast is well worth your time, folks. He did Hebrews about a year and a half ago. It, you need to listen to it. It's really, really useful. They're long. They're an hour to hour and a half long each time. Uh, just as you're driving, as you're cleaning the house, as you're cooking, as you're tired of reading and doing anything else, slap the headphones on, listen to that. He's got another uh, pot, uh, uh, whip, uh, uh, what's the YouTube thing? called French Pop 321, which is great because he deals with things that no other uh, biblical uh, person wants to deal with. He deals with aliens. He deals with uh, uh, New Age stuff. I mean, he deals with... It's, it's done very cool. And he has a lot of fun with it because he's got a couple of alien creatures on set with him. <laughs> stuff like that, you know. And you'll see, he's very down to earth. Now, the usual caveat, there's things that... I don't think I agree with him over on some things, but that's okay. It's nothing significant. And I've probably learned more from him in the last couple of years than uh, I've learned from anybody of late. Uh, he's got another, uh, I can't remember the name of another podcast. Uh, oh, what is the name of that thing? Uh, you'll see it all on his webpage right there. That other podcast is really, really interesting. He brings other people on and they really do go into areas that, most church people are scared to even have a question about. And so you know how that is. You want to know. And man. Uh, so anyway, are y'all still there? Are you all looking on your, uh, your you're looking at web pages right now, aren't you? I know what you're doing. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's okay. That's great. You know? So anyway, I, I think the sons of God are, uh, you want to check the context no matter what. So you may see where the sons of God are uh, an angel reference. That's cool. But really checking, when you see Elohim right there, that's really, really interesting. When you see, see encounters like you see in 1 Kings 22, when, when God consults his divine counsel as to what to do with Ahab and how to put Ahab to death, and it comes back and it says this, well, one of them suggested this and one suggested that. They're having a discussion over this, offering God suggestions as, as to how to do it. One of them says, hey, I know how to do it. I'm going to put a lion spirit in the mouth of his 400 um, prophets down there. And God says, yeah, do that and you will succeed. And he sends, sends him. And that's how he does it. Go read 1 Kings 22. It's amazing and with that divine uh, counsel uh, perspective. Also, on Heiser's website, they've got some great little videos, like maybe an eight-minute video that explains that whole thing and what's said there in Psalm 82 and some other things. I uh, guess very, very, very useful uh, uh, it will not be a waste of your time in any way. So I, I share all that to say this. I think there's a lot more going on in the heavenly realm and in the unseen realm than we know. Okay? Because out of my background, you think, okay, there's there's God and there's Jesus and there's angels and that's it. But tell me, just from your previous biblical studies, what all do we know that is going on in that unseen realm, in the heavenly realm? What other beings are there? So you have the divine beings of Elohim, whatever that may be. You have angels. What else? Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, in this particular subject matter, it wasn't difficult at all with me because it explains so much. Once you see this, uh, once you uh, see this divine counsel thing, once you go over to Deuteronomy 32, it explains what happened. It explains what happened with what we call the bad angels here in a minute. Okay. You have the living creatures in heaven. Yeah. Y'all continue on while I talk about this stuff. What else, what else we see? It explains what, what really blew me away is the divine counsel thing. It explains what you see in Genesis six. It also explain, explains why the women had to have the hair covered in first Corinthians. And I'm not even going to get into that right now. You have the seraphim. What else you have? You have the cherubim. What else you have? So you have the the, uh, the living creatures, the 24 living creatures. You have elders. You have angels. You have various types of angels. We know that from the scripture. Okay. You have two or three of them. They're actually names. I think there's two of them that are named in the New Testament. In the Jewish writings, I think they have five of them that are named. Uh, uh, one of them is Raphael. I remember that. <laughs> no. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're not necessarily angels. I know the 24 elders are not angels. They're what? They're other beings. They're other creatures. They're other things right here. And it just sort of, and when you read the scripture with this in mind, all of a sudden you start saying, wait a minute. I made the automatic assumption that every time I saw something like that, that it was an angel. And that's wrong. See, and that, that really starts getting some things going, you know? <clears throat> So let's do this real quick. Uh, pressing on with these good angel things that we're talking about, I have to do this sort of quickly. You looked up a lot of scripture passages. Tell me, uh, what were some of the things that the angels did? Okay, we know that they're ministering, okay? We know that they can be present when you may not know they're there. Have any of y'all ever experienced that? Have any of y'all ever experienced an angel? Or think that you've experienced an angel? It's actually sort of a weird thing to even want to talk about. What do we know? Sure, I think you would know. Absolutely. You may not know at that moment. And particularly Hebrews says that at the end. It said, hey, y'all be hospitable because by doing this, you have entertained angels unaware. You know, people want to go, oh, well, that just means that you can't. No, 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 no. Okay, Carol's husband did. There may be times when you, looking back, think that you have. Uh, I've got a great example of that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jan will know that the, the Baptist church I was at in South Florida and I was about to leave that place. I just found out I was leaving and it was happening very, very quickly. And so we decided to have just a night of worship and not really even tell anybody it was on a Friday night. I believe I, that Sunday was going to be my last Sunday and the people in the church really didn't know it. Just my friends, they just found out. And so we decided to have an evening of worship. And so we um, just told some folks, I don't remember who it was. I don't remember how it happened. And we had a night of worship, and we were just there singing and praying. <coughs> and all of a sudden, we looked up, and there was a lady sitting there. And Jan will testify to you that this sanctuary, which would seat a thousand people, was as all sanctuaries are. They're nosy. You remember, Victoria. They were nosy. I mean, noisy. <laughs> you couldn't walk in that place without the doors creaking, is what I'm saying. That kind of stuff, you know. And so we look up, and here's this just beautiful black lady with very Romanesque features, you know, straight nose and straight hair. And just, and we said, well, hi, oh, glad you're here. And she said, yeah. And so we just continued worshiping and praying. And so um, I think somebody actually asked her then, you know, how'd you hear about this? Well, I just heard y'all were meeting, so I just thought I'd come. And so we, we met for a time, we worshiped, and then, you know, we, we just sort of left, you know, didn't really dismiss. Well, mine and Jan's dear friend, Lynn, Lynn uh, Lady Lynn, my wife's best friend the last, what, Jan, 35 years probably. She lives over Atlanta about three hours from us now. And um, she just sort of walked her out the front door. And this front door is on a very, very busy road. They, they go out to the front of the church there. And uh, they're saying goodbye. And Lynn's saying, are you sure that I can't give you a ride? She said, no, I just live right down the road here. She said, well, I just live right down that way. And, you know, well, okay, fine. And so they, you know, whatever hugged and said goodbye. Lynn turns to go back in the building. But then turns back real quick to say something to her, and she was gone. And this front porch and this front portico right there, right, Jan, is not somewhere that you just disappear from. 
I mean, yeah. she, she would have seen her. <laughs> I was the only, was the only one that stayed, stayed there all night. night and she, she stayed, stayed there, there all night, night with, with me. me. Sleeping, sleeping with, with me. me. Oh, I didn't know that. All alone. And, and I, she, she walked, walked out, out the door, the door and, and met them. them. And uh-huh. then she didn't, she didn't talk, talk to her, her like that. that. And, and she came, came, they came in, and, and I said, did you see Victoria? Victoria? She just she laughed. And they said, yeah. yeah. And, and when, when I, I looked out the door, she was gone. gone. Yeah. She <laughs> couldn't go more, more than, than 10, 10 feet, feet, and she, she was gone. gone. Yeah. That's, That's how I, I that, that was, was what, what I was referring, referring to when I said, I believe I see angels. Yeah, and we really do. We sort of believe that that definitely was one right there that are, and. Your next story, and that was it. And that I think that was actually something significant for us years later. And we wound up worshiping for about 15 years in a place that. Uh, uh, so that's, that's right, Rachel. So was it a male angel that took on a, a woman human form? Or are they even male or can they just appear? I think they can appear as God wants them to appear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think they can appear that way. The ones that you see in scripture are usually fighting angels or delivering messaging angels. And they uh, were male, but I don't want to, people automatically want to assume, well, since they're male, they're all male. I don't want to say that. Okay. Uh, it's, it's what we simply don't know. Okay. Okay. Rachel wants to know, can they take on a form of a, a child? Well, I feel real safe in the answer of that. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but I don't want to limit it to say, no, they have to be an adult form or, or whatever. No. I think to think that God could speak through a child like that, that he could take on something like that in that way. But I simply don't know. I do know that the angels, we saw that in Matthew, that they ministered to little children. Remember that? I, yeah, that might be a good thing there, Kimmy. If it's something that's going to be, you know, that we that we see if there's a message. But you saw how people reacted. Um uh, there's times when angels appear and uh, people think they're just a person. Okay. The, the, the couple on the road to Emmaus, right? They see Jesus and they think he's just somebody, right? <laughs> they're like Clarence in a wonderful life. Uh, <coughs> when Gabriel appears, he comes giving a message, but he's not necessarily an angel that they're bowing before instantly. Over in Revelation, John has an angel guiding him around that encounters another one. He falls for him and starts worshiping. And that angel says, Why not? Don't worship me. Don't worship me. You know, I'm just like you. Okay. So uh, Rachel says, My sister actually speaks to angels. Not good because they could not be of God. Are there angels that are not of God? We'll get into that in just a second. Well, of course there are. They are of God, but they've chosen to go another way. Well, sure, hospice nurses would tell you all the time because of what they see day in and day out of what angels are. So uh, some of the things you saw, you saw that angels are used as God's uh, punishment, uh, his judgment type of thing. You saw the angels would come back with the Lord when he returns. Real quick, as far as dealing with the good angels, I don't talk about the bad angels. You saw, uh, you have to tell me what that homework's about, Rachel. You saw uh, one particular angel that was mentioned with a title, the angel of the Lord. And you looked up several scripture passages related to that. Who, what, when, where, why is the angel of the Lord? Oh, that, that's it. Okay. <laughs> We're about to get into it. Great. What, what was your conclusion about the angel of the Lord? Most of them was revealing a Hebrew name of God, El-Rohi. Yes, the God who sees. Uh, Abraham, uh, Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. What was it with uh, Gibeon? Wasn't that great? Yeah, I mean, with Gideon, not Gibeon, Gideon. Jehovah Shalom, yeah, uh, Lord is peace. So who is this angel of the Lord? Just from what you read, and boy, each one of those folks is a, a phenomenal uh, study, a phenomenal account, so much to be gleaned from it. Oh, and I didn't mention Moses, the angel of the Lord in the fire of the bush. I am Jehovah. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's probably reasons why they didn't mention that. You know, there is the, you know, you can't go through every example. And that right there brings forth some really interesting questions that you don't want to rabbit chase with. 
So what's the bottom line? Who's this angel of the Lord? Now, I'm going to wait for some answers here. Yeah, I've got all night, man. Rachel just had lunch. She's ready. I mean, she can kick back. Carol's thinking, I want to go home and just eat. I'm tired. Rachel's already into this bag of chocolate she showed us a while ago, guys. My goodness. <laughs> Is there anything better than gathering with the body of Christ around the word of the Lord and the power of the Spirit breaking bread together and your bread is chocolate. I mean, you know, I'm serious. I, I, that is just, well, there you go. You know? So who is this angel of the Lord? Or is that even a, a proper question? Okay, when Moses encountered the angel of the Lord as God, really, does it not say, it doesn't say that he's God? Well, this Jehovah, here's what's interesting about all these. <clears throat> Is that when you read the account, just reading it from this perspective, and particularly when you're reading it from the divine counsel perspective, or, but just read it from the homework we were doing and what we were examining. They all call him Lord. And this goes beyond just the, uh, uh, the patterns of the day kind of thing. They call him L Lord. Because they actually say, the Lord who will see. Abraham, you know, they call it, he declar declares, he's Jehovah Jireh. It is Jehovah that did this. It's Jehovah that brings peace. So it's actually, uh, it's actually God. Some want to say, yes, exactly that, pre-incarnate Jesus. It is God in the flesh. Okay? It's God in the flesh, the angel of the Lord. Okay, and so how that might be, if it's Jesus God in the flesh, okay, but it's God in the flesh, and so yeah, we may call it pre-incarnate Jesus, this and that. I don't want to get distracted with all that in the argument that people pick up from there, but is God taken on the form of flesh to communicate and be there with? Now, you see the angel of the Lord bringing forth judgment, too. One is not supposed to look upon without dying. You can look upon this one without dying. I don't think you can look upon God as the spirit without dying, though you see uh, Moses and the 70 elders of Israel sitting on the slope of Mount Sinai breaking bread with God, and they didn't die. Okay? So quickly, because our time is flying by. There's some bad angels. Who are the bad angels? Exactly, Rachel. They can take on human form. So you can have some bad angels. Uh, Satan's a bad angel. Uh, Lucifer rebelled against God. When he rebelled against God, and he's powerful, folks. He's enticing. Angels decided to go with him. How many of them? Yeah, a third of the angels. And that's always sort of intriguing because that tells you the angels are numbered. Now, whoa, 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 Rachel, what do you mean principalities? That's interesting. Yeah, there's two thirds that remain loyal. What about the principalities? What's that, what's that all about? Oh, there's order to angels, okay, okay. Yeah, you see that. Uh, Lucifer was uh, a, um, a worship leader. Oh, yeah. Okay, so can't see Rachel's comment, so can you repeat what she's saying? Sure, yeah. Uh, Rachel says something about principalities. Hmm. Uh, are there any other bad entities, <laughs> for lack of a better term? Okay, you got the snake thing. You got whatever happened with that. Uh, you got dragons and all that. What's that all about? Yeah. Well, you saw what's going to happen. You had destroying angels. You got the devil and his angels. So we know the devil's got 
angels. What are demons? Well, demons possess people, but just what are demons? Uh, Jan says a bad angel follower is Satan. Kimberly says evil being spirits. Uh, yeah, where'd they come from? No, that's where they're destined. Hell. <laughs> uh, Kimberly smells a rat and says, uh, Satan with a question mark? What do y'all What do y'all think? What, what, do you, uh, what did you think, or can I say assumed, uh, that demons were? Well, an offshoot of Satan, what, what, what's he been shooting with? <laughs> Okay, you're sort of thinking that it's the third of the dragon swept out of heaven, those angels in heaven that had been worshiping God, but then they went with, with Satan and they uh, became demons. Okay? That's what I always thought and assumed, and that may be correct. <clears throat> but you hear me equivocating. Okay? That may be a quick, correct, because I don't know. I don't know. And this is part of some stuff I'm learning, particularly with the Heiser material and some other things and some other stuff. There's a school of thought. So they've been banished out of God's presence. Yeah, they have. Uh, are they limited to earth? Uh, it seems to be for the period of time, the heavens and earth around here. There are some of them. Uh, well, we're talking about demons right now, okay? Uh, they seem to be limited right now. But remember what the sons of God did. The sons of God were the ones that came down in Genesis 6 and cohabitated with women and had offspring that came forth. There's a school of thought, and this actually comes out of Judaism, and but a lot of people in academia sort of believe this. There's a school of thought that the demons are actually the spirit offspring of those sons of God and the daughters of men. I'm giving you a moment to process that. I don't know. Oh, yeah, demons are unseen. Okay, they're they're uh, like angels. They're in the spirit realm. Okay, they possess things. Now, the giant, they were. They were giants. Okay, the Nephilim, the Anakim, all that kind of stuff. Sure, they were there. But those had what? Spirits of some kind. They weren't spirits in the same way that man has been made in the image of God because they're half-breeds, for lack of a... They're sons of God, and those sons of God that came down and cohabitated were likely rebellious sons of God out of divine counsel. And you see it in uh, uh, hints of that in Psalm 82 and some other places. <clears throat> okay? And you say, well, well, you know, their bodies were destroyed after the flood. That's true. <clears throat> but where are their spirits? Was well, it just this limited amount? I don't know. What happened? Why do we have the same thing even after the flood? You had giants after the flood also. You know, though not as many, more than likely that has to do with Sham, Ham, and Japheth's wives and the seeds that they carried, the genetic things that they carried and some stuff related to that. I simply don't know. But we do know from what you saw in Second Peter and Jude that there were some that were called uh, angels there that came and stepped outside their proper domain. When you look at it, there were likely sons of God that did that. Yeah, that's it. Barbara says our battle is definitely not against flesh and blood, is it? Uh, and, you know, yes and no. I say that, and I'm usually speaking from the point of view <clears throat> that our battle is not against each other. Okay. It's not against each other. It's flesh and blood right here. But it is against this realm, against this unseen realm, which is driving things. But there is a flesh and blood context to it, because if I'm looking there, looking at somebody and they're manifesting a demon, okay, it's happening in this flesh and blood. I have to keep in mind that this flesh and blood entity, this person, no matter how evil they are, was created by the Most High God, is made in the image of God, okay? And right now, there's a demon messing with them and in them, and that we, by the power and the authority and who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, are given authority to say, Leave them alone by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get lost. The Lord has given us that authority. We refuse to live in it because we're scared. 
we do what happens with the Gadarene demoniac. Remember that dude? And actually, there was two of them. One gospel talks about one, focuses on one, and another one mentions there was a couple of them. I feel sure there were several people that were like thing, but the scripture really focuses on this one. So Jesus has his encounter with him and everything. And remember, isn't that the one where he, uh, 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 the, the demon uh, was having a conversation with Jesus and asked to go into the pigs? Was that the one? I think that was it. And uh, Jesus grant that. And so the, the demons, all these hundreds of demons went into the pigs. And what did the pigs do? Yeah, they head for the water. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> actually, it's the first case of devil ham, right? And then uh, they, all the pigs committed suicide. You know, people laugh over that, but they'll remember it, folks. <laughs> they remember it. Yeah, yeah, they died. They, they they ran off the edge of the cliff. Now, did the demons die? No, the demons didn't die. The demons prefer to have an organic being in it to live in, but they don't, they'll they'll live in something else. Remember when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, I think, he said, hey, it's not the idol. It's not the image right there. It's not that wooden thing that you made that is the idol. It's the demon associated with it. The demon associated with it. So if you sit there and carve out a piece of wood, and then you come along and call upon Satan to come and inhabit this thing. He's going to send forth a minion right there that will inhabit that thing, even though it's not alive. But they prefer an organic thing. Well, the guy that was set free, here's what happened. The townspeople heard what happened because they just lost their livestock. You know, they come back and they find this guy who they could not chain, but they find him. How? Remember? Fully clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And the townspeople freaked out over that. They just didn't know what to do with it. And it scared them so that this man is now fully clothed, that he's now in his right mind, and he's sitting there listening to Jesus. They were so terrified by that that they did what? You remember what they did? What did they ask Jesus to do? They asked Jesus to leave. To leave. And so he left. The man that had been set free comes to him and wanted to travel with him. He said, no, no, no. Jesus said, stay here. Go home and tell folks what happened to you. Jesus comes back to that region sometime later. It wasn't that long later. He comes back later. This time, they welcome him with open arms. You know why? And it was the region of the Decapolis, the 10 city region. That guy had gone forth and told everybody what Jesus had done for him and how he set him free. But see, we're scared to even consider the fact that the Lord has given me the power and the authority to speak to this situation. We agree with what the world says. We'll sit there and say, oh, man, something just came all over him. Not taking for a moment one thought of consideration as to what that something might be or seeking the mind of the Lord or realizing, wait a minute, they're being messed with something demonic right here and speaking to it and telling it to leave in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Barbara gets posted right here. What about verse 1, John 4, 4? You are sons of God, little children have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Yeah, absolutely. We don't appropriate. We don't live in with what he has given us. You know, with being true believers, we have the fullness of God in us, not just a little bit of it. God the Father, Son, and Spirit dwell within us. John 17 speaks to that. Dwells within us. Angels are about us. Angels are here to minister to us. You saw some of the examples in the scripture where the angels minister to people, whether it's bringing food to the prophet or helping Jesus after a 40-day fast and an encounter with Satan himself and those three temptations that he had. You know, Angels will minister to us. We just need to walk in faith. We need to realize, yeah, sometimes we walk in fear, I think, because we think, well, you know, angel can, uh, uh, Satan can appear as an angel of light, you know? Yeah, he can. And a lot of his, a lot, Satan's got a lot of servants of righteousness and they're in a leadership position in churches. That's the reason that we as the body of Christ need to function the way we're supposed to because those that the Lord has given the spiritual gift of discerning of spirits will know who is of God and who's not of God. But that right there is, I think Rachel said a while ago, really challenges what we're accom you know, accustomed to. It sort of pushes the envelope with us. Are y'all still there? Or am I just ranting and raving to myself? Okay, good, good. So, oh, oh my. It's, our, our time's up right here. Anybody have any questions, anything you want to share? Obviously, this whole thing about angels is just uh, 
a, a, a starting point. Okay, just a starting point. I'm gonna go back and check the Facebook page to see if uh, if I posted those podcast links. I think I did. Uh, those would be so so useful uh, just to listen to mm. as you're uh, going about and and realize, folks, that uh, there is an entire unseen realm that is far vast than we can imagine. And I think that's just the beginning of what really creation is. We see, boy, you talk about but in a mirror dimly. We really do. And that's okay. It's all right. Uh, we will understand and we will see much more uh, in days to come. So, Lord, I thank you for that. My, we, we just love you, Lord. and We rejoice in you. Uh, in your creation, Lord, and all that we see right here, Lord, may we never, ever see any one of these angel passages or uh, demon passages or Satan passages the same again. May we see the totality of what you've got here for us to understand. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. See you next time around.